There's Betsy, there's Sarah, there's a deer. Hi, dear. These are all my deers. Hello, everyone. Ron Spomer back with Ron Spomer Outdoors Podcast, and we have some corrections from our viewers today. A really nice letter from a gentleman named Kyle in response to an episode I did on some ARs and why someone would choose them. There was a question from one of our fans asking, why would anyone choose to hunt with an AR-style rifle? And this gentleman has some pretty good reasons. So Kyle writes and says, let me first say how much I enjoy your content on multiple platforms, and I find you to be both informative and entertaining. I just love it when they butter me up. <laughs> now, I'm writing in response to your RSO podcast, episode 257, the question posed by this gentleman regarding why one would choose to hunt with an AR-style rifle. I have a very practical response I wanted to share with you. I'm a former competitive shooter, and three-gun was my passion for several years. Additionally, I was an early adopter of the 300 Blackout following Daniel Horner's use of the cartridge to win the USPSA multi gun championships. I was drawn to the 300 Blackout for hunting and immediately found parallels to the 3030 Winchester. Additionally, I had two daughters who would be ready to hunt Texas whitetail soon. I was searching for an appropriate youth rifle and caliber combination, and I almost selected a bold action rifle in 243. That's one that, by the way, I often recommend. However, I knew my next AR build would be a 300 blackout because the platform would be ideal for young hunters. So here's my why. First, my daughters each shot their first deer when they were eight and nine years old, respectively. They were obviously small in frame size, and the AR platform is adjustable, and it has grown with them. Second, the AR's gas-operated system provides opportunities for reduced recoil, and I knew I could build the rifle with an appropriately weighted buffer, bolt carrier, and adjustable gas block in order to ensure reliability and to tame recoil as much as the system would allow. I refused to do to my daughters what had been done to me by my father regarding caliber selection and recoil. <laughs> Luckily, they have never developed the flinch that I had to overcome, and they're not recoil sensitive today, even when they're shooting magnum calibers. Good point. Third, I tamed the noise of the rifle with the suppressor. While this is not exclusive to the AR platform, it is an uh, important part of the 300 blackout. Plus, teaching young shooters to be competent and confident is more readily done if you can quiet the scary noise of the gunshot. Four, easy to install drop in AR triggers provide exceptional quality and are wonderful tools for teaching young shooters trigger control. Fifth, the selection of the 300 blackout as a caliber has been exceptional. The longest shot we will take with the rifle on deer is 200 yards, which is quite acceptable with the load that I've developed. The caliber provides all the advantages of a 35 caliber projectile, plus a case capacity that lends to reduced recoil. My favorite hunting projectile is a 125 grain Nosler ballistic tip traveling 2,230 feet per second. I have attached the data for the velocity drop and energy, which you can see is more than appropriate for game-sized deer up to 200 yards and beyond. The girls are now 20 and 16 years old and love to hunt with their dad. They still use the AR and 300 blackout exclusively on whitetails and wind hogs. We're venturing out uh, out of the whitetail woods and have picked up a South Texas axis hunt, a New Mexico pronghorn hunt later this year, both with rifles other than the 300 blackout. But the girls often argue about who will get that rifle after I'm gone. Maybe I should build another one. Regardless, my why to why anyone should hunt with an AR style rifle has much to do with why my girls love to hunt and not afraid to get behind a rifle. Thanks again for all your great content, and I look forward to learning more from you in the future. And I want to thank you, Kyle, for your great content. That was a good story with a lot of important points about why an AR is a good rifle to use for hunting. Now, I do have some of Kyle's data here, and I do want to point one thing out. He's given me his ballistic drop chart, his trajectory charts, 
And he has his uh, 300 blackout zeroed for 100 yards, which means at 150 yards, it's dropping two inches. And at 200 yards, it's dropping 6.23 inches, six and a quarter inches, which is pretty good. I understand why it works so well out to 200 yards. I would suggest, Kyle, that you consider zeroing it a little farther out, perhaps 125 yards, because your mid-range trajectory, according to your chart here, you're not even climbing an inch above your aim out to 200 out to 100 yards so you could easily afford to sight it a little bit higher for that mid-range trajectory and still be dead on your deer and that would probably keep you at 100 at 200 yards you might only drop three inches so just something you might want to consider all right that's great folks i always like it when you comment send in your experiences and details like that because I just because I've done a lot of hunting and shooting doesn't mean I've done all of it and I've certainly never started young girls hunting deer with an AR oh now back to our regularly scheduled questions here's one from Jason 264 Winchester Magnum now that's a cartridge I've chambered in a Cooper rifle those are good rifles I think this cartridge can still compete with the likes of the 6.5 PRC or the 6.5 Weatherby uh, RPM. What are your thoughts? Well, I'm with you, Jason. You know, the 264 Win Mag was really a, it wasn't a trendsetter, but it was a little bit ahead of its time. And a lot of guys will say, you know, the powders were not quite there yet to really take advantage of it. So the 264 Winchester Magnum in 1956, I believe, um, was a 375 H and H belted Magnum case or the 300 H and H belted Magnum case, necked down, shortened to 30 at six length, and obviously it was taking a 0.264 inch diameter bullet. Pretty unusual in that day and age. You just didn't have 6.5s around like we do now. They've really taken over. So it was a bit of a novelty. Folks knew the uh, 65 by 55 Swede, but it wasn't real popular over here. So Winchester was kind of breaking some new ground and they pushed it as a hyper velocity cartridge for out west. And I think they even called the rifle it was chambered in the Westerner and had a 26 inch barrel on it. And it was screaming. They had this thing cranked up. These days they've throttled back. A lot of the ammunition manufacturers have throttled back the loads from their original speeds. And uh, the 264 suffered as a result as a result of that. But before they did that, it started suffering from reputation from gun writers like me, unfortunately. Some guys who really decided they needed to harp about barrel burning. Anytime you are putting a lot of powder into a small caliber bore, you're going to have throat erosion from all that flame being concentrated in that tiny little diameter. So, any of the Magnum cartridges burning a lot of powder are going to do more damage to the throat than a smaller powder capacity cartridge. Well, it's one of the ways you get your velocity up. I always say you have to pay the price if you want the speed. So the price is you're going to maybe be a little harder on your barrels. But I don't think that the shooters of the day and the writers of the day were doing it complete justice. You know, they got a little bit too excited about, oh my gosh, we're going to burn out the barrel without really covering it from a pragmatic perspective, which is I'm hunting. I need a long reach cartridge without a heck of a lot of recoil because it's a 6.5 shooting 140 grain bullet, probably the top end. Great deer cartridge in open country, pronghorn, sheep, goats, and all that stuff, and pretty darn good on elk as well. Well, if you want to reach that far, you want to shoot that flat and beat the wind deflection and all the rest of it, got to pay the price. And how many rounds are you going to shoot through a hunting rifle to burn the barrel out anyway? These guys are going varmint shooting with it and shooting a lot hot barrel stuff. And that wears the throats out faster because of the flame. So I think it got short shrift, but the damage was done. And the real nail in the coffin came in 1962 and Remington came out with two things. They knew at that time Remington model 700 bolt action rifle chambered for the seven millimeter Remington Magnum cartridge. And that is almost exactly the same case as the 264 Win Mag, but it opened up to take a 0.284 inch diameter, seven millimeter bullet. That meant the throat was a little wider, the caliber was a little wider, there's less of the throat burning going on. Plus, 
you could shoot heavier bullets. Right out of the gate, they built that thing to handle 175 grain bullets, as well as 140 and 160 and all the in-between sizes. So it became a more versatile choice than the 264. Guys who were thinking, you know, if I'm going out west hunting mule deer and elk, someday I might do moose and a big bear, I might go to Alaska, I better get the bigger, the bigger one, the seven, rather than the 264. So quickly after 1962, that 264 Winchester Magnum really started to lose. And it just never really got its feet under it anymore after that. But today, with our slower burning powders, a lot more efficient in that particular case, you can do darn well. And you're probably going to be driving your bullets faster than you can with the 6.5 PRC or the Weatherby RPM. I haven't studied them real closely and compared, but you were... You were known as a screamer back in 1956 with the powders they had of, in those days and the bullets that they had, which were not not as efficient as the high BC bullets today. You start working with that 264 Winchester Magnum, and I think you're going to be impressed. It's going to throw those those 140 grain bullets. Oh, wow, it's got to be at least 3,000 feet per second, probably even a little faster. So uh, play around, look at the uh, loading manuals, the latest ones where they've worked with some of these new slower burning powders. And I think you're going to find out that that 264 Winchester Magnum is still a pretty hot item. Here is a question from uh, one of our patrons on Patreon. And he asks, when are you working up, oh, when you are working up a new hunting load, how do you increase powder charge from your starting load? All right, so for those of you who haven't gotten into hand loading yet, and I suggest you do so quickly because it is really fun. What we do when we're working up a load is we go to our load manuals, the, hot, the Hornaday reloading manual or handbook, the Nosler, the Spear, the uh, Burger. Most of the bullet manufacturers will have a book out of recipes, essentially, for loading your cartridges. Hodgdon Powder has them too. The powder companies will do the same thing. In those recipes, they will have a certain bullet and then a list of powders and different starting loads that they worked with up to their highest pressure load. And the recommendation, and it's a wise one, is to always start at the low powder charges because every brass case is slightly different in size. Every chamber and every rifle is slightly different in, in size, uh, as are bores, barrels, and everything else. So you really never know how much pressure you're going to be developing in your case with your primer, with your powder, with your bullet in your barrel. It's just a little bit risky to start with those high pressure loads with a lot of powder in them. So if a particular load says the top powder load we have for this one that drives your bullet the fastest is 58 grains, um, but they're starting down at 52 grains, you better not start at 58 grains because something might break loose <laughs> if you've got a particularly tight chamber or something. So start low, but then how do you work your way up? That's what this gentleman is asking. How do you work your way up? Do you put in two more grains of powder or half a grain of powder? I always figure with a fairly high volume case, like around a 270, 30-06, you can do one grain increments um, increase. So if you start with a 54 grain load and everything looks fine, the rifle didn't recoil really hard, you don't have a hard boat lift, there's all these little signs you look for for pressure, especially looking at the case itself. And you don't see any uh, undue looking expansion or no cracks in it. The primer is not flattened out. You don't see ejector marks on the base of it and all these signs of high pressure that you can learn about when you read these reloading manuals. If you don't see any of that and your velocity is pretty low, like it says in the book, you know you're not approaching any kind of dangerous pressures. You can put in another grain of powder in your next load and try again. What I do to save uh, materials, not so much time, but materials, is just do one at a time. I start low and I make a load at Let's say it starts at 54, the next one I will load up with 55, then 56, then 57, right up to the top. Now, I might not shoot all of those. I'll take them all out to the range, shoot the first one, check it, second one, check it. As long as I'm not getting excessive pressure looks on my brass or the bolt throw lift and all the rest of it, I think I'm safe to keep shooting that higher, one grain at a time, higher load until I do see those signs. And if I see it at 56 or 57 grains, I do not shoot the 58. I just take it back home and you can either 
throw it away as a relatively cheap experiment or pull a bullet off of it and still use the case. I have bullet pullers. They're pretty simple to use. So I'll pull that bullet, dump out the powder, start over and save the case and the primer and the, and the powder. The bullet might get dented or smashed, but I generally use those just for a fouling shot anyway. So I'm really not losing anything but a little bit of time. So work your way up by one grain increments. Now, if you're using a smaller case cartridge, like say a 243 Winchester or a 65 Creedmoor, and heaven forbid a 223 Remington or something really small, you'd better go down to a half grain increase in your sizes because it's a bigger percentage of your powder load. And uh, that's basically how I do it. Um, increase the powder charge with those levels and watch what happens. Now, you can also... Be watching what happens on the target. Do something called a ladder test. Um, but those really don't work all that well with this system because ladder tests are usually done at 300 yards or farther. And what they tell you is when you've reached the accuracy node of your barrel. Barrels are vibrating, wiggling around violently and such when you shoot. And if there's a certain node in there where the barrel is minimally vibrating, um, it's going to shoot more accurately shot to shot. And you look for that with a ladder test. So I better not confuse anybody with description of the ladder test right now. We'll do that another time. I'll wait for someone to ask a question. <laughs> and my talking about it right now just might be the impetus to have you ask that question. Hey, Ron, what's this ladder test you were talking about? And then we will cover it um, by itself. But what I just covered is the safe way to work your loads up until you see those pressure signs. And if you can, always use a chronograph. You can pick those things up for $80 to $120 these days. They're surprisingly accurate for that price. It's not much, and it really tells you a lot about what's happening with your load development. If your velocities are getting right up there where they should be and your pressure signs are starting to look like they're matching up, you know you've got a pretty good safe load. All right. Good question there, sir. We appreciate that. Let me fill you in on a little secret. The RSO TV membership gives you exclusive access to my videos. All of my videos ad free hunting, shooting, gun reviews and more. And you get a 15% discount on all items in the RSO TV store. So click on the link below and sign up. Now, what's this one? Hmm. Now here's, I think I asked this once before, but everyone's interested in it because there's something new. And this is from Hornady. It's their CX copper alloy bullet. Now for several years, Hornady has been loading their copper bullet called the GMX. And I've taken bears with it and feral hogs and red stag and had good luck with them. Um, but Bullet makers are always trying to improve their products, and I think that's what uh, Hornady was doing with their GMX bullet. And they put some new relief grooves in it that look double radius, uh, somewhat like the hammer bullets. But hammer has a, uh, I'm pretty sure they've got a patent on theirs, so this must be a little bit different. But I've noticed in some of the, um, I haven't seen the bullets yet, but I've seen the photos of them, and it looks like there's a couple of bands, groove bands cut into the bullet. And that is going to reduce your pressures and your copper fouling and should improve the performance. I don't know what they did with any of their alloys. You know, you can mix different alloys in with your copper to get different degrees of hardness and softness to increase or decrease the uh, expansion. I don't know if they want their pedals to break off or stay on top of the bullet. Haven't looked into any of that yet, but a lot of guys are excited about this. You want to look into it. It's the new CX copper alloy bullet from Hornady. I suspect it's going to be improvement over the GMX, and I found that one to be pretty effective, so it should be good. All right, what else do we have here? Lorenzo has a question about Africa. Where would you go for your first safari hunt in Africa, and who would you go with? <laughs> oh, man, there's, I've been over there so many times with so many great PHs and outfitters. Roughly, I would recommend you do a plains game hunt. If money is no object, you go do whatever you want. But if you're like most of us and you're trying to get a really good buy, these plains game hunts in South Africa and Namibia and to a lesser degree, Zambia and Zimbabwe, but mainly South Africa and Namibia, you'll end up hunting on a private ranch or some native 
ground that is controlled by uh, essentially a tribe, a certain gr- group of people over there had it as similar to a, a reservation in this country, I guess, but they will lease those out for management by a pH. And he'll have this vast area that he gets to manage for the villagers and they get the meat and they get some of the money and they get jobs and it all works out really well. But there's so much competition from all these private ranchers and then those consortiums for the uh, hunters coming over there that the prices are wonderfully low. So it's a lot like hunting in Texas, Wyoming, Montana, and a lot of those areas. It's fairly dry, fairly open, and or brushy, but not what you would think of as the Tarzan jungle Africa. It doesn't look like that in most of those places. So it's fairly similar, um, and if you've done any hunting in the West or in Texas, you'll kind of feel at home. It's not a real foreign environment. And you can glass and find game at a considerable distance, and I enjoy hunting that way. And you see a lot because these ranches and farms over there have figured out that they can make more money ranching wildlife than domestic cattle or sheep. Just because these animals are native to that country and they do well with the vegetation that's there, you don't have to do anything special. You just harvest them at a sustainable level and it works out great. So you will get to hunt and often you get to help call because there are so many animals on there. And because most of these places no longer have wild dogs and lions and a lot of the bigger predators, they have to do a lot more culling of the overpopulations. And I've gotten involved in a lot of those for oryx and and puku and springbok and a lot of the different antelope that are really pretty prolific. So You get the fairly low price. You're helping out the villagers by providing meat. You keep the farmers and ranchers in business so that their ranches don't get converted into some kind of a development, which no wildlife benefits from. So it's really a good system. And they now have more native game animals on these private ranches and consortiums than in their national parks because there's just so many people doing it. So that's where I'd suggest you hunt. You're not going to get that that Tarzan feeling of the deep, dark, wild, jungly Africa. That doesn't exist in very many places anymore. But boy, for your first trip over there to get a taste of it, I think you'll really enjoy this. And most of the pHs over there do a really good job. Um, They treat you right. The food is wonderful. And the lodging is just great. If you're used to Camping out rough in the United States, especially up north or in the west, it's not like that over there. (laughs) It's more like luxury. They've got buildings for you to stay in and beds to sleep on and real furniture and and real plates and dishes. And you eat at a table and there's a beautiful fire in the evening outside and have your sundowners. I mean, it's just a real treat. So give it a go. As far as particular places to go, I don't know that I want to start listing all of those because often these PHs and or outfitters will change hands and you'll have had a wonderful experience because the particular guide that you had was really good or the PH, Uh, but the new owners maybe change things up a little bit. So you always kind of risk being getting in trouble unless you've just recently been there and double checked on it. But If you write me, I can do a little bit more research. So write me in the comment section for some recommendations, and I can give you a few in each of those countries, Namibia and South Africa. But that's definitely where I would go. And play your cards right. You can get a pretty good hunt for around $10,000. Might be a little more than that now, but that includes flying over there. We usually get a round-trip ticket to South Africa for $1,500 to $2,000. And then your outfitter will probably charge you anywhere from $4,000 to $10,000, depending on how many days you stay and how many animals you take. And you can usually add animals when you're there. You buy a package hunt for five animals and you say, this is so much fun. I think I'll spend some more money. (laughs) He'll probably let you buy a few more. All right. Good question on Africa there, Lorenzo. This gentleman wants to know something that I might not be able to help him with, but let me figure it out. This guy's name is 338 Federal Shooter, and he wants to know black bears in Georgia. I'm thinking of a few hunts in the southern swamps, maybe one in north Georgia in the mountains. Can you give me some tips because it'll be my first time hunting bears? We can only hunt bears in the fall. So why I 
a little bit worried about this answer is I have never hunted bears in Georgia. So I can't give you any information on actually hunting bears in Georgia specifically, but I can give you some information on hunting bears. Generally, black bear hunting in the fall is going to involve baiting if it's legal where you hunt, or glass and stock, or group drive type hunts. I know in a lot of eastern woodlands, it's so thick, you can't really glass bear the way we do out here. But a lot of guys will be deer hunting, for instance, and they're in their stand and someone bumps a bear and it runs by or wanders by on its own and they take them that way. Other guys will run hounds, and I don't know if that's legal in Georgia either. That used to be a big deal in all the Appalachian hill country. Um, that's a good way to get a bear up a tree. And the nice thing about with dogs, as well as bait, is that you have time to study the bear so you don't make a mistake. It's often difficult to judge a bear's size and age. So if you have him up a tree or he's feeding around in front of you in a pile of corn or something, you've got plenty of time to size him up so you don't accidentally shoot a female or a small bear. You can go for the old boars. So that's a great way to do it. But some people think that's not all that sporting. No problem. Do, do whatever works for you. Then I would say you want to be in a tree stand and look for runways and all kinds of bear sign. I've mostly hunted bears in the spring and it's easier to find their sign because the boars are getting started with the annual rut. They rut in the spring. So they are marking territory and they'll rip trees. They'll get up against a tree and rub their back on it to leave scent on it. And they leave droppings out on the trails in obvious places. And we speculate that the size of the droppings <laughs> matches the size of the bear. And that informs the competing, the competing bears how big you are. This is my territory. I'm this big. <laughs> you don't want to mess with me. That's what we are imagining anyway. I don't know if it's legit, but that's what you want to look for. Now, out here in the West, we do pretty well on logging roads in the mountains. So if you're up in the mountains of North Georgia and they've got some old logging roads around here, those grow up with some pretty palatable forbs, dandelions and clover and different things. And the bears love to eat that stuff. So if you've gotten a fresh rain, you got some good green up along the edge of the road, they've got extra moisture seeping off of the road and it makes for a pretty good crop. Plus, the road is fairly recent. The trees are open. It's any more sunlight. You get more food. Otherwise, you're going to look for, for nuts. And I would guess if there's a good acorn crop or any other nut tree that's produced a lot of mast, those bears are going to be keying on that. Other things would be persimmons, pawpaws, any of the native fruiting trees. Bears are going to like that sort of thing. I don't know if they consider that baiting. I doubt it because it's a natural food source. So you might want to look for that stuff. The swamps in Georgia, boy, I'm pretty much at a loss there. I have not been a swamp hunter. I've paddled some canoes through some swamps in Georgia and Florida in the off season just to snoop around and get a feel for it. But I would imagine it's fairly difficult to pattern and hunt bears in the swamps. That is the best that I can tell you, 338. So um, I commend you for trying something new. And I think you're just going to have to get out there and enjoy the entire experience of figuring it out for yourself. And of course, you can ask some locals, shop around, uh, try to find some literature. I'm sure there have been plenty of articles written about Georgia bear hunting, as well as swamp bear hunting that would apply. Um, and there may be a few books out there as well. And you can do a Google search or a YouTube search for how-to videos on YouTube. And you should be able to figure it out. The fun part is going to be getting out there. Whether you're camping out or driving in each day, you get to uh, start snooping around the wilds and figuring things out. And for me anyway, that's half the fun. All right, guys, those are the questions for this episode. I want to thank everyone once again for all of your questions. And especially want to thank Kyle for answers because he had some darn good ones on why the AR is a good hunting rifle. We really appreciate that. Well, this is Ron Spomer signing off. Once again, we appreciate you writing in. Any corrections you might have, any advice better than what I gave you here, we like to find that stuff out and share it with all the rest of you. So send it in. In the meantime, Hunt Honest and Shoot Straight. Mm -hmm.